we periodically try to uh, have meetings outside of San Francisco. Earlier this year, we were in Monterey Bay Peninsula and also in San Diego. Now, of course, we're here in Reading. Next year, we'll, there'll be some, a couple other locations. We've been to Orange County, Los Angeles, Fresno, and so on and so forth. It gives people uh, that are in the far flung areas of the state sometimes an opportunity to come and physically appear before us and tell us their concerns. So we've been meeting with local government representatives and others, but with principally local government representatives, uh, all day today, hearing concerns uh, evidenced by uh, uh, the elected representatives of local government. So uh, before I uh, open this up uh, to the public speaking, I want to say a couple things. One, two things. Say something about safety, and then I want to ask each of my colleagues if they'd like to say a few words. Because I, as you should be aware, we certainly are. Safety at the PUC is uh, our number one priority. Toward that end, I'm going to just address a couple of uh, big concerns in this venue that we're uh, in right now. In the event of the emergency, obviously, we all will please calmly proceed to the exits. We have four, three in the rear and one on the right-hand side. In the event we do need to, re to evacuate the buildings or the rear exits, head out through the lobby and out the doors towards Cypress Avenue. From the side exits, head out the door and out to the east parking lot. Our assembly point is the uh, Civic Center building at the intersection of Cypress and Civic Center Drive. In the event of an emergency, I'm designating our executive director, uh, Paul Clannon, who's here and sitting back there uh, to call 911. And our uh, chief of chaos, David Aaron Klopp, and along, is a certified CPR expert on first aid and will be in case of any emergency in that regard. Now I'm going to uh, ask each commissioner if they'd like to start to say a word or two, starting with Commissioner Farron, who's on my left. Thank you very much. Uh, I would like to also uh, thank the City of Reading for providing the facilities. I believe that we monopolized all the meeting rooms in the building next door uh, as we had a series of, of meetings with um, stakeholders uh, from around the area. Uh, what I'd like to do is just give you a very brief uh, biographical sketch of me so you uh, uh, have a sense uh, of, of the kinds of people you're dealing with. Uh, I was appointed to the commission in March 2011 by Governor Jerry Brown. Uh, so I've been serving for just over uh, two and a half years and I have about uh, oh, a little over a year left to run in my current term. Um, before I became a commissioner, um, I should say this is the first time I've ever worked in, in uh, government of any kind. Uh, I spent 25 years in the private sector in the banking, finance, and operations uh, areas. Uh, many of those years uh, outside of the state of California, in fact, outside the country. So um, my perspective on matters here are very much as an outsider. Um, and so I've, I've tried to, very hard to try to uh, um, learn and understand the issues that are facing uh, the people in the state of California. Uh, in terms of areas of interest, um, there are broadly four areas that, are, um, that have been uh, assigned to me as, as commissioner. Uh, the first one is energy efficiency, uh, very important in uh, uh, a keystone of our energy policy to uh, uh, ensure that we uh, um, use, our, use our energy resources wisely. Second is the renewable portfolio standard, um, which is, as you all know, um, our goal to have uh, at least 33% uh, of, of renewable energy by the year 2020. Uh, third area of interest is um, what we call resource adequacy, which is uh, our process for ensuring that we have adequate power supplies for the next year going forward. And uh, increasingly we're looking at uh, means to ensure that we have uh, adequate reliability across the system and in local pockets uh, as we move to greater penetration of green power. And then finally, um, what we're calling the water energy nexus, which is uh, uh, the recognition that uh, water is an incredibly important uh, uh, resource here in the state, and the, uh, the management and transportation of water represents about 15% of the energy use in the state. So solving the riddle of how to be efficient with using water, getting it where it needs to be, uh, is also part of solving the riddle of, of uh, how to, uh, how to save uh, the energy in that process. Um, I'm, I'm just delighted with the meetings that we had today. Uh, to me, it's extremely important that uh, 
we get away uh, from the commission now and again. Uh, our proceedings tend to be dominated by uh, legal work and paperwork and, and uh, a very formal process. And uh, it's great to get out and actually see other parts of the state and talk to people here about uh, uh, what their concerns are and what we can do to address those. So um, very happy to be here and looking forward to uh, hearing comments from, from you folks. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. I uh, really wanted to thank the people of Reading and the city of Reading for their generous hospitality today. It was a wonderful opportunity to meet with a number of people from uh, the north, uh, the northern region of our state and hear um, about issues affecting the state. Um, one of the, the comments that I heard yesterday, I was also able to attend a very useful forum yesterday on uh, broadband internet access. Uh, up here in this northern region, and uh, we had about 47 people who attended. Um, they said that they often feel like they don't get much attention because there are only 1.7 million people in this part of the state. But keep in mind that there are only 800,000 people in the state of Vermont. Um, so, you know, there are more people here than there are in the state of Idaho. Um, so California is a big state with 38 million people, and this is a very important part of the state. So we are here also to learn about your issues, to hear from you directly. I wanted to thank President Peavy for uh, arranging these meetings around different parts of the state. Um, this is my second time since I uh, had the good fortune to be appointed by Governor Brown in 2011 to the Public Utilities Commission to uh, visit Reading and uh, have meetings here at Reading. Uh, my telecom advisor, Bill Johnson, and I also held a public participation hearing in Eureka in August, um, looking at our lifeline proceeding, the telecommunications program for low-income Californians. And we had the opportunity there to uh, go to Del Mar County, also visit uh, with the Yurok Reservation uh, and the Yurok people, California's largest tribe, and then have meetings in uh, Eureka. So we are very sensitive to the fact that um, the issues are different here. The topography is not the same, and it pre presents both challenges and opportunities, whether for telecommunications, uh, for water, uh, rail, rail crossings, energy, and a variety of the other issues. So just uh, in terms of my focus, um, I spent a lot of time on telecommunications matters. I uh, directed a department at the FCC for six years during the Clinton administration. Um, I've taught telecommunications law for the last uh, 10 years before being appointed. Um, I'm also very active in many of our water matters here at the commission. Uh, I'm active on a lot of our small business matters and then very actively involved in a number of energy matters, including uh, the water energy nexus, but also uh, what we can do to ensure that our resources are provided in a manner that is safe and reliable at prices that are just and reasonable. So look forward to hearing from you and we look forward to our meeting here tomorrow. Again, wanted to thank you all for being here. Yes, thank you. Uh, I'm also uh, delighted to be here in Reading. Uh, we had a, a very informative set of discussions this afternoon and exactly what, why we come to other communities outside of, of the San Francisco, Sacramento corridor. The issues here are very different. I've learned a lot already and look forward to hearing more this afternoon. I uh, was appointed by Governor Brown in January of 2011 and I'm about halfway through a six-year term. Uh, prior to being on the commission, I spent 30 years as a consumer attorney at the Utility Reform Network, a consumer group that represents customers at the PUC. So I been around the agency for many years and uh, have recently had this opportunity to see how hard it is from the inside to, to really do the right thing for the people of the state. Uh, it's my first time really spending much time in Reading, but uh, I did grow up in the rural Midwest, so this, this is uh, a bit like a homecoming to to visit a, a more rural area and uh, see how different life is than, than in the big cities. Uh, I did spend some time more years ago than I think to account uh, 
doing a, a set of great hearings for what was then known as Pacific Power and Light, now Pacific Corp. Uh, we had hearings in both Wairika and Crescent City, and uh, I've, I've loved this part of the state ever since, but sadly haven't been back, so uh, uh, enjoying being here. I've, uh, I have a wide variety of mostly energy cases that I work on, uh, the aftermath of the San Bruno explosion and the uh, investigation into that, uh, issues around the closure of the San Onofre nuclear plant in Southern California. I'm also the assigned commissioner on the long-term planning proceeding for electricity where we look at emerging needs over the next 10 years and I'm happy to say Northern California is in pretty good shape in terms of electric supply. Uh, we've got some challenges in Southern California particularly with, with the nuclear plant going out unexpectedly but uh, we don't have any of those problems currently in the North and that, that's a good thing. Uh, also work on a number of rate cases, including the, the current PG&E general rate case that's pending. Uh, work on a lot of transmission cases where utilities are uh, seeking authority to uh, uh, upgrade or expand their transmission system. That often involves uh, significant environmental impact issues that we have to consider. And generally a uh, pretty busy slate of issues that we have in front of us at the Commission, but uh, I have a great set of colleagues here. Everyone is really dedicated to doing the best we can for the, the people of this state and welcome your comments this afternoon to uh, help uh, educate us on, on the issues that are present here. So, thank you very much. Thank you, President Peavy. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, let me add my thanks for hosting us here in Reading in your region. It has been a very productive day, and I uh, echo all of my colleagues' sentiments around uh, the value and importance of us uh, getting out of San Francisco and having the time to uh, meet with you in person and start putting some faces to our names and vice versa. So I appreciate you all coming out here this evening. I'm the newest uh, member of the commission. I was appointed in January of uh, uh, this year, and so I'm approaching my one year anniversary. Uh, prior to starting at the Public Utilities Commission, I was a commissioner with another state agency, the California Energy Commission, which is in Sacramento. And at the Energy Commission, I was the lead commissioner for renewables, transportation, natural gas, and our independent energy policy report. And one of the aspects of that job I really appreciated uh, was the opportunity to work with a diversity of cities and publicly owned uh, utilities and had the chance as such to work with a number of the utilities in this region. I learned from that experience that there's no one size fits all model for regulation and policy. Uh, but indeed, that's one of the challenges that you know, I face every day as a commissioner about how to do policies at the state level, recognizing some of the local differences and needs. And I appreciate the comments we've had today uh, from parties about how our policies are uh, enacted on the ground and some of the challenges and opportunities that you're facing. Uh, prior to coming uh, to state service, my background is a mix of economics, business, and policy. Um, I uh, came to California to do a PhD at Cal uh, on solar power. I've always been interested in uh, sustainable energy and how to provide that in an affordable way. I started off uh, in banking, do a power plant financing, and then worked my way west. Um, in terms of my portfolio at the commission, we have collectively over 600 proceedings active at the commission, so there's a lot. Uh, divided between all the offices, but as my colleagues have said, there are a couple of key areas that uh, each of us uh, tend to focus. So I am interested uh, historically in renewables, and I think in order to develop renewables, you have to do it in a way that's safe and reliable for the grid. And so at the Commission, I've worked on a number of different uh, policies that are meant to support the integration of renewable energy. 
The primary one I have now is a proceeding on energy storage. And energy storage is about uh, kind of thinking about a sophisticated Tupperware, taking power when we don't need it, storing it in a battery or another device, and deploying it at higher value times. Uh, I also uh, do a lot of work on alternative vehicles, uh, specifically electric vehicles and natural gas. Uh, thinking about how do we make sure that our electric and gas infrastructure are adequate to support the deployment of alternative vehicles as well as maybe provide benefits as well. Uh, I have a proceeding dealing with access to broadband through education networks and I also have the Cal American uh, general rate case and so really a, a breadth of projects. Um, and so again, I appreciate you being here. What I've learned from this job is how all of these utility issues are integrated. Uh, I'm a rate payer, as my colleagues are, and we're all faced, uh, like you, with an electric, uh, gas, uh, you know, water, and a communications bill. And, and we see the impact. And so, you know, as we move forward, I'd like to continue to be in conversation with you about how we manage the rate impacts, but also move forward on these very important social uh, policy goals that we have here in California. So thanks. Thank you very much. Okay, um, I'm going to uh, call upon the speakers in the order in which we receive their names. Uh, the first is Marlene Del Rosario. You come forward, please. I'll ask each speaker to uh, try to conclude their remarks and theories on that. The next speaker will be William Gira. Thank you very much for letting me speak today. And pardon my nervousness, I'm not used to speaking in this venue. Uh, I'm a 30-year resident of Orville, California. And uh, from the time we first moved in, we've been very aware of um, conservation and making sure that we planted a yard that was um, uh, not in need of as much water. We don't have lawn. We uh, decked our entire backyard. Um, and we understand that water is a valuable commodity. But we found that recently Cal Water has asked to increase our water rates by 26.3%. Uh, I live on a fixed income. Um, my husband and I are very proud of our yard. In 1997, Barville started out giving out beautification awards for the homes that kept, the people who kept their homes in good condition. And we got the very first award. We're very proud of that. We're very proud of our home and keeping it up. But because we live on fixed, fixed income, we don't think that we're going to be able to maintain our home in the way that we have. Uh, we're asking, I'm asking, please, don't allow them to increase the rates by 26.3%. Uh, I My uh, COLA isn't that much, you know? And, and they haven't got, I haven't gotten the COLA recently. And uh, so that's my request. Thank you very much for listening to me. Thank you very much for sharing. OK, William Guerin. My name is William Guerin. I want to, first of all, tell you that this is one of the most beautiful cities I've been in Northern California. I'm odd. I moved to Oroville in June of 2012. I'm 66 years old. I'm retired from the aerospace industry. I finished up about a 12-year stint as an IBEW worker. I worked in the solar projects down in Lancaster. They've got some real nice projects. You talk about renewable energy. I moved up here to satisfy my wife's wants and needs. She's got kid folk up here. And one of the things that stunned me when I moved to Orville, I was going over to this water department, and the first thing they told me that there was a $31 fee for a meter on this water works. Now, you know, they got, they got some water needs down there in Lancaster. That's a long way from here. I moved up here. I thought maybe water would be, you know, as good as Colorado water. 
I, I, I came from Colorado, they have some pretty tasty water. It is unbelievable. The formula of this rap, this ram, and as commissioners of, a, of this utility, can, do you understand how they regulate? When you can serve, you pay more. How is that just? We pay more for water in that area because we're with Cal Water twice price for a, a meter. The guy across the street pays $14 a month. I'm, I'm stunned at this. Uh, I believe they should roll it back. My understanding is their calculations on the formula, how they put this pricing into play, nobody can explain it to you. Nobody really knows how it works. You need to know more about this. I don't think it's just the area is depressed. There's a lot of things going on in Oroville that need to be addressed. I wish I could talk to somebody about Comcast. I'm not happy. I'm here about water right now. I'm here about water. And uh, I want to thank you for your time. And I would hope that as appointees and as commissioners, take a look at this. We, we need, to, we need it to be studied a little closer because there's a fair shake. There's a, other companies giving a lot better deal, and it's all the same water. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Richard Marshall, and then Robert Rice. Thank you. Good afternoon, uh, Chairman and Commissioners. I'm Richard Marshall. I'm a rancher at Fort Jones, a small ranch up there, and I'm here to speak today about the surcharges that are leveled against the people of Siskiyou County. Uh, I'm also serving as the president of Siskiyou Water Users and representing the people who have voted up there in Siskiyou County, Measure G, to keep the dams in place. That's an election process, which we've tried to make the commission aware of on numerous occasions. It was conducted in 2010. And during the past few years, the interest in keeping the dams has been growing in that area substantially. We want to make you aware of that fact. I'd also like to suggest uh, to the chairman and the commissioners that it would have been nice to have this meeting up in Wairika. I know you have reasons why you think you can do it. But I would suggest that before uh, the year is out, you come up to Wairika and see Northern California at its best up there. This is North Central California right here. Yeah. North Northern California. Uh, also, you know, Pacific Corp doesn't service this area. There are no ratepayers in this area that are affected by this process. The dams, three of the four dams that are taken out are in Siskiyou County. 68% of the climate river impacted there is also in Siskiyou County. And yet Siskiyou County was never part of the negotiations with the KHSA or KBRA. They were never included in that process. And they should have been. You've added insult to injury by insisting on conducting this inquiry, as I said, far from those who are impacted. I would suggest that maybe you're not really interested in hearing from people in Siskiyou County, Modoc, and these other counties who some, it's a four or five hour trip just to get here one way from some of these areas. But I'm still happy we're here and we get a chance to talk. Siskiyou County is economically depressed, as you may know, it's 17th uh, most depressed county in the United States, even though it's the fifth largest in land area in California. This has happened as a result of numerous uh, actions by federal and state agencies which have taken away all of our industry, logging, mining, etc. We're now down to agriculture, and that's where the surcharge plays a big role. My neighbor, for example, is paying nearly 10000 a month for electric bills right now. We have other people in our valley area that are paying even more than that for water to provide uh, water to their uh, alfalfa crops, which are servicing organic uh, dairies down in the valley. One of the issues that we'd like to bring to your attention, which we have in, in other occasions, is that these dams which provide the energy for there in our, our area, 70,000 homes in fact, as well as our Siskiyou and Modoc County areas, are renewable energy 
people like to say they're not renewable energy, but there's nothing like water energy 24-7. Uh, you can't beat it, and it has to be there because solar is not, oh, the sun's not always shining, and the wind doesn't always work. And besides, anybody who's seen wind farms knows they're not very attractive. So why is the commission so committed to the KHSA? The funked agreement put together by a collection of NGOs, a few tribes, and a consortium of government agencies, all who have their hands in the pot when it comes to collecting money out of the KBRA. I don't know how familiar with the KBRA, but there's about $3 billion ultimately that will transmit over a number of years uh, to those groups. The Department of Interior has not ratified the KHSA. It's not an effective agreement, and yet, when we talk to you about the issue of the surcharges, you're basing your surcharges on the fact that KHSA exists. And we're saying it's not a valid agreement. Dr. Paul Hauser, a scientific advisor to the Department of Interior, has indicated that the corrupt uh, information, which is provided by the DOI in trying to support the rule of these dams, and he was fired for that, by the way. You may know about that. But actually, the salmon in that area are more supported by the PDO, the Pacific Decay Oscillation, than they are by the dam uh, process and the dam removal won't help the fish, basically. So CPUC's own Division of Ratepayers Advocates have weighed in on these issues and clearly and emphatically stated the Commission shouldn't be charging these surcharges. If you read your own information that comes through, the, through that group, you'll see that that's the case. What's going on here? Pacific Corp, a uh, Warren Buffett company, has heavy investments in alternative energy platforms in the Midwest and other areas and gets a sweetheart deal from CPUC, including, amongst other things, an accelerated depreciation schedule on $450 million, an insurance policy to protect them from the certain damage result, uh, removing the damage will cause, two trust accounts with funds provided by the rate payers to the tune of $200 million, a promise from the state of California for a gift of $250 million. And last but not least, a release by NOAA and authorization through an ITP to destroy the climate ecosystem throughout the five watersheds that are impacted. The policy <coughs> by NOAA specifically notes that no one has examined the impact on human public health and safety. In addition, Pacific Corp is not being required to account for the float on the funds that are generated. Let me just finish by saying, I think that the commissioners could play a pivotal role in solving this problem up there if they would turn their attention to uh, trying to promote the idea of Pacific Corp meeting with the citizens of those areas to try to work out with a task force how to solve these problems without these so-called stakeholders, the NGOs, interfering in the process. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Robert Rice, then Edward Valenzuela. I'm Robert Rice, President of the Board of Trustees, College of the Sisters, located in Wheat and by Riga. We have two campuses, the Wheat Campus, obviously, in Wheat, California, and the Wairika Campus in the city of Wairika. The college um, has, since the date of some of the agreements that have been enforced, 2010, uh, uh, has a PUC endorsement for the uh, years of surcharge. Our power costs have exceeded $1 million in three years. The rise in costs <coughs> dates back to an appearance before you of Pacific Corps Director of Government Affairs to receive CPUC's endorsement for their advice letter to implement Schedule S199 Klamath Dam Surcharge. Early in the spring of 2010, Congressman Herger, U.S. Congressman Herger, became concerned about some of the things that were going on in that part of the world and asked PUC excuse me, asked the power company uh, what uh, is going on, and the response was simply uh, that uh, he had talked to, that they had talked to some stakeholders, and the preference from the stakeholders was that dam removal 
was preferred over relicensing. Mr. Herger was told in a letter on April 1st, 2010, that these 26 stakeholders in the 2008 agreement in principle preferred an outcome of dam removal and went for relicensing. That reaction caused a lot of concern and caused a lot of heated discussions in the, within the people of Siskiyou County. We went together and put together Measure G. Measure G was on the 2010 ballot. There were 26,000 voters that participated in the 3 million acre uh, college district and they voted 79% in favor of retaining the dams rather than uh, going for, or retaining the hydroelectric power facilities rather than going for dam removal. I wish for you to take note that there are nine counties in the Klamath River Basin dependent on the hydroelectric power that comes from the Klamath River. Seven of those counties did not participate in the signatures associated with the two agreements. And just recently, an eighth county also joined the group. So it's now eight of nine that do not participate in what's going on. In, a, in that April 1st letter to Congressman Herger, Pacific Corps' Director of Government Affairs said, throughout the stakeholders' settlement process, Pacific Corps had held steadfastly to four basic objectives. Protect customers from uncertain costs of dam removal. To that objective, the college replies as an example of what's being felt throughout the college district. Our electrical utilities have driven from 237,000 in years 2010 and 11 to 313,500 in the years 2013 and budgeted for 14. That's a $76,000 rate payer increase in three years or in the case of a college, a 13.3% increase. The third item in Pacific Corps' letter to Mr. Herger said, protect customers from liabilities of dam removal. Various organizations in Siskiyou County are following the results of dam removal in Oregon and Washington. The environmental impacts, the economic impacts, and the social impacts are astounding. So much so that projected costs for both the KBRA and the KHSA, which are partnership agreements, inflated and expanded to the year 2030, when most of all of this activity will be completed, is now at $3 billion. All of which will become either a taxpayer or a ratepayer responsibility. The fourth basic objective in Pacific Corps letter to Mr. Herger said, to ensure that customers continue the benefit from low power, cost of power of dams until the dams are removed. As stated earlier in this presentation, the cost to the customer is already grown. It's at 3.8%, 13.8%, and will grow continually for the next six years until 2020. The real surprise for us, however, is what's going to replace the hydroelectric power, the clean energy power. And we have been informed that this will come from natural glass, a replacement through a pipeline coming west to Oregon, still hasn't entered California. Hydroelectric costs, considering the average household, amounts to $200 a month. The price of natural gas would be $815 per household per month, a cost increase from $4 a day to $27 per day. That's not fair outcome. That's not a fair outcome 
for rural communities who depend on resource and ag economics, both high electrical costs for product output. Community colleges work hard to stabilize community vitality, and being concerned about what's going on is one of our missions. Finally, we have on record a letter from the Siskiyou County Water Users Association dated 1-29-12. It is in your files. It says briefly that CPUC acted without or in excess of its powers and jurisdiction when it granted the original application of the Civic Corps because the California legislature had not approved the hydroelectric facility dem demolition on the Klamath River in Siskiyou County. A copy of that petition will be submitted with my uh, presentation today for your review if you no longer have it on file. In 2010, when the water bond, which included $250 million for hydroelectric dam removal, was withdrawn, it would have been appropriate for CPUC to withdraw Pacific Corps authorities for a surcharge until both the legislature and the public endorse the agreements. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Okay, Edward Johnson left, Alexuela, and then Don McIntyre. Ladies and gentlemen of the commission, thank you for the time. Uh, my predecessors here, Mr. Marshall and uh, Mr. Rice, have really touched on the subject of the climate dam surcharge. Uh, I am currently the District 2 Supervisor for Siskiyou County, currently acting board chair, so most of my comments are going to be in reference to the, uh, the board's wishes, if you will. Um, again, uh, the surcharge is something that has, for a, an event that has not taken place, and there are several things that you hopefully are aware of that have to take place for that to uh, occur. Uh, specifically, a Department of Interior uh, notice has to be filed, if, and legislation has to be enacted. And if you know what's going on at the federal level, you know that's not going to happen anytime soon. Uh, the other part of the equation that uh, I just want to get more on, more on the personal side is that, you know, Siski County is an aging community. Uh, there's limited jobs up there. There's not a whole lot of young families. So when you add a surcharge, you really are affecting our senior citizen population. And if you see where the Social Security increase is going to be minimal at best, you know, we're all going backwards. These gentlemen that are ranchers and farmers, when their pumping rates go up, you're just taking it off the bottom line. A lot of the people up there, because we don't have natural gas, we use, some people use electric heats. Again, you know, it's, it, you're, there's a reason why the people voted for a state of Jefferson. You know, they're getting attacked from all fronts. And certainly a surcharge, even though you may seem minimal to a lot of people, is in effect a straw that breaks the camel's back. So I would ask that you would reconsider that and stay until at least something develops, whether it's federal legislation, whether California comes up with the money that they have to allocate for that. Uh, the other uh, thing that, uh, Commissioner Corio, thank you for saying that you have been up to wire against some point. So precedent has been set, if you will, that when it comes to a, a surcharge, when it comes to a rate uh, issue that's going to affect Pacific Power, that you would come up to Siskiyou County. I see more than a fair percentage of our audience from Siskiyou County, which is from some of these gentlemen, two hours of drive. I can assure you this room would be filled with Siskiyou County residents if we were in Mount Shasta, if we were in Wairica, if we were in Doris, if we were in Happy County. So I would ask you to consider that uh, down the line for the next go around. I do appreciate you at least being up this far because we'd love to get a handful of us to go to San Francisco. So with that, please give that strong consideration about that surcharge because it's a it's a huge issue. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, Don McIntosh. We call by Judy McIntosh. Hi, uh, I'm Don McIntosh. I uh, I live at uh, five three two two Hoya Road, uh, Weed, California. I'm a retired PG&E. Uh, I, I have a ranch and. Uh, so the previous speakers have uh, done a good job uh, covering things that I agree in. Um, and so I'll try to keep this brief, which I am a brief person. So a few years ago, we had a, a formal 
uh, California PUC uh, protest case against P uh, Pacific Corp. It lasted for three years, and there was a hundred filed documents. The number was A05-12-0. I see Commissioner Peavy is not in his head. He remembers. <laughs> and so, anyway, the uh, in this case, we uh, paid for a $12,000 power flow study on uh, Pacific Corp, um, uh, the southern power grid, and then the northern uh, uh, portion of PG&E power grid. <clears throat> and the uh, study showed that uh, the four hydroelectric generators uh, produced uh, 169 megawatts which uh, supplies power to Southern uh, Oregon and all of Siskiyou County, and uh, we can sell and deliver uh, 70 megawatts to uh, PG&E in Reading. So um, the point, uh, well, see, the, the hydro generation is the most efficient, the most cleanest, the most dependable energy, it improves water quality, it, it improves conditions for fish, and so uh, it is a beautiful thing. It would be terrible to remove it. And, um, and uh, even though, um, let's say you have another energy source coming in like uh, natural gas, um, you know, power companies always want, they would never intentionally let, um, let's say, hydroelectric uh, go. I mean, you know, you need to diversify uh, power uh, sources. So, uh, you know, beside electrically, uh, hydroelectric has a, a lot of different uh, benefits for operating, and we won't go into that, but uh, the uh, main point is, let's see, I want to skip a lot of the cost, you know, like the ratepayers are going to be paying all of the cost, you know, for the removal. They'll pay for the new replacement generation that has to go in to replace what they're taking out, uh, and that uh, that uh, they'll have to pay a higher rate for that power, you know. Let's say they put in the natural gas, and so uh, uh, all of that goes, and you you're, you lose the irrigation water for the, you know, agriculture and so forth. So, and I'll jump there. But the main, the main point of this thing is that um, this project is a very, it's a bad one, and um, and it may not happen. So, uh, so why should the ratepayers be built, uh, you know, for a project that may not happen, and especially one that. Uh, you know, was voted down uh, 75 or 79 percent of the, the voters voted for keeping the dams. And so, incidentally, um, you know, a while back, um, I did uh, talk to a Pacific Court guy that, uh, and we talked about old things. You know, I, you know, was in the Virginia for uh, power power control for years, and so. Uh, you know, he did uh, make a statement indicating that Pacific Corp would never have given up the uh, dams without the pressure. And that uh, if this thing doesn't go through, most likely they would be happy to, to have the dams back. So, and that should uh, cover it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, Judy McIntosh. Thank you for the opportunity to um, address our concerns. Um, Judy McIntosh, um, Pacific, Pacific Power Ratepayer, We California. Um, as, uh, as a customer uh, of Pacific Power, I'm really outraged at the surcharges that PUC has granted Pacific Corp for the removal of the dams on the Klamath River. Um, as my husband mentioned, uh, we have a history with PUC and, and Pacific Corp, and um, 
what I wanted to relate to you is what um, what was said to us at uh, our hearing in Weed, California by the administrative law judge. What she told us was something that may happen is not even taken into consideration because it may not happen. There seems to be a double standard in allowing Pacific Corp to charge the ratepayers for something that has not yet happened. It should not even be taken into consideration until it does happen, or at least until it has been given final approval. Pacific Corp has us at a disadvantage to begin with. It's not as though we can go elsewhere for, for our power. That's where you come in to protect the ratepayers. I am shocked at what Pacific Corp has been allowed to do. At the end of our proceeding, Pacific Corp, through a surcharge, was allowed to bill the ratepayers for intervener compensation. That was at least something uh, Pacific Corp owed. But why would the Commission grant Pacific Corp surcharges for something they are not paying for and may never have to pay for? and in turn penalize the ratepayers for something we are not receiving and do not want. Isn't it part of the Commission's function to protect the ratepayers from this very kind of action? As has already been mentioned, approximately 79% of the ratepayers in California are against dam removal. Through taxes and surcharges, we will be forced to pay for dam removal and restoration, and through taxes and higher rates, we will be forced to pay for a replacement source of power. And why? With hydroelectric, we already have the best source of energy there is. Why would anyone want to get rid of clean, re not reliable, renewable energy? Um, we simply can't afford to give up this fight, not against dam removal or against unfair surcharges. I urge the Commission to protect Pacific Power customers from paying for expenses not incurred, and I ask you, and I ask for your full and fair consideration in this matter. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, Mason McCoy, followed by Carrie Price King. My name is Mason McCoy. I live in Hawaii. Rica. There have been several preceding speakers that have invited you to Hawaii. Rica. I do would look like to invite you up there. I know we're small in numbers, but when you start putting together the dam removal, water rights, the rates we're paying for electricity, I guarantee you can find more people that are all in the color up there than anywhere else in the state. I've been pretty upset with the rates we are paying for residential areas and around Wairika. My wife and I are on fixed income, and there's no way we can eat our house with electricity. I mean, it's just it's out of the question. It's scary enough just to turn on the bathroom heater on a chilly morning. We have two sons that live in the Rogue Valley area. And they're paying, I'll keep the round numbers here, they're carrying out to six digits. They're paying about eight and a half cents kilowatt hour in the Rogue Valley area. I have a friend in the Eugene, Oregon area He's paying 8.3 cents. We have another son that lives in Halfway, Oregon, clear up in the northeast corner by Oxbow Dam, by Baker City. They're in the 7 cent bracket. In Wairica, we're paying 14 cents. Why are we paying for the same company almost twice the rate? The only thing I can think of is the other three areas Pacific Corp best in competition. And that's all I've got to say. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. 
Gary Price Jr. Hi there. I'm a part year resident of Northern Colorado and part year resident of North Central California, I find out today, although from Sonoma County. And I'm here to speak about the utility of the future presentation that you all um, participated in on October 8th, which was very impressive and very inspiring, and it's, it's something that um, I hope the rest of the country is looking toward, even though I didn't agree with absolutely everything said. There were many, many wonderful aspects um, to, uh, and I'm going to borrow some of the terminology, some of it is from utilities, some of it is from others. But generally, I support utilities as full-service energy companies, as managers of operations and customer programs, and as providers, not just as transmission and distribution operators. With due respect to Bain, who I was sitting next to a representative of, we had a polite little uh, debate afterwards, I am no fan of Texas-style retail competition. I believe the level of expert coordination needed at the ISO level in order to implement the state policy objectives is greatly enhanced by expertly coordinated LSEs, loan serving entities, which optimally, I believe, could be led by the IOUs in their ability to innovate in green energy programs, that is, optimally. So please embrace short cycle innovation and bundled products and services. Please allow value propositions through this. For example, somebody subscribing into, under SB 43 as an example, um, a solar garden that they could also at the same time subscribe, to, subscribe into per, perhaps a program where they would shift their own personal load into the solar hours or should they have an electric vehicle to to change their charging time until after five o'clock we learned today in the DR workshop that 41 percent of people start charging at 5.30. There seems to be a really natural fit with the increase that we're expecting to see in that. Hopefully this would enhance the value and the cost effectiveness of implementing the state policies and enhance value to the system as a whole, as we all know, the duck, you know, or whatever creature, you know, we want to call it. Please support the creation of suites of such mutually beneficial products into one overall arching green program. Dominion is doing this. They spoke about it at the renewable energy markets in Austin. And it's very interesting because it's, it's more seamless for the customer because if they subscribe to one, there's a product that has a lifetime that's better to let that drop off. The, the, the customer can still identify with their aspects of it, and yet there may be products that shift there was also discussion of that in the last few days in demand response, that it's good to try, try different things as you're moving towards these new paradigms. Um, I also think that that will help with customers being able to grasp what's happening. And community or citywide programs may also help facilitate this because education is such a part of the, the battle, creating the buzz of neighbors actually learning about this at coffee shops and restaurants type of thing. Please allow, as we heard this over and over, please allow streamlined or stepped up re regulatory approvals so the process of change can be more nimble, which is hard in the regulatory structure and was also said often in the, in the demand response workshops. The change that is upon us is fundamentally as much about communication and education and listening to customers, for example, today as you're doing as is the physical move from a radial model to a network model of distribution. And thank you for the opportunity for that. There's lots of room for amazing, wonderful creativity, and I look forward to your next steps on the process. Well, thank you very much. Okay, John Remke. I'm John Menke. I'm a fourth generation Californian. For the one uh, commissioner there, my father owned a lot of Pacific Power and Light and also a lot of PG&E. Those stocks used to be excellent investments. I don't know what's happened to these uh, businesses. Uh, they've been taken over by corporate uh, owners and they're no longer focused on the, the customer. We get good power uh, supplies and I, um, I, I would like to tell you I, I have degrees in mathematics. Um, 
uh, range in wildland science, agronomy, and a PhD in range systems ecology. I'm a modeler, a mathematician type. But um, I became completely disenchanted with uh, after having done a sabbatical leave with the Klamath National Forest in uh, Siskiyou County, uh, after having done a big one many years earlier in the ne Netherlands, um, I became aware of the lack of professionalism in the government agencies, and uh, I could no longer continue my career of 25 years as a professor um, at University of California at Berkeley, University of California at Davis, School of Forestry and Conservation at Berkeley, and then Department of Agronomy and Range Science at Davis, 25 years of teaching young people because their science and skills were no longer respected. The training uh, facilities and programs in the state of California have declined precipitously. I have no respect left almost for the natural resources field training that are going on in the state of California. I was interested in hearing the people from Oroville as your first speakers today and I um, I understand what's going on. The area north of basically um, uh, about north of Davis actually, the population size is so low that the perception of um, ecologically thinking people is this area should be converted to a park. <laughs> remarkably enough. In Siskiyou County, the, the, the size of that county is remarkable. We only have 45,000 people. I was born in San Francisco in 1945 and uh, grew up in Sacramento. My father was a surgeon in Sacramento. He wondered when they were going to start pulling the blacktop up off in the Sacramento San Joaquin Valley. It's the most valuable, productive uh, Mediterranean climate for producing, producing healthy fruits and vegetables of anywhere in the world. And yet, development is continuing to cover the landscape with houses. It is an absolute disaster in the making. We have none of those issues in Northern California or north of here. None, none at all. Boku water, Boku resources. But we've got a complete corrupt resource management program going on in Washington, D.C. that they're locking off all the resources to the people. This is an absolute disaster. The spotted owls, nothing is being done for the spotted owl. They can't even get to their prey base, which these are uh, feed on fossorial mammals on the ground. The forests are so choked with overstocked forest today that the owls cannot even feed. I'm, at, I'm really appalled to see what's happened. As to the dams, I only have one minute 41 seconds left, but could talk for an hour on this subject. Even my colleagues at Davis said that the slower passage time of water by water being held back by dams provides the blue-green algae the opportunity to sequester the natural high phosphorus in the waters coming emanating from Upper Klamath Basin, and it does a remarkable good job of bioremediating high phosphorus levels in those waters. Can you imagine Catherine Kuhlman, who had a, two hats on when she was involved with the FERC relicensing? She's willing to pull out those dams and flush out 21 million cubic yards of high phosphorus algae, 200 miles to the ocean. Can you, and this is, this is the wild and scenic river. We actually, remarkably enough, have complete corruption on this dam removal process. And you might be amused to know that only about two weeks ago, the EPA granted the Yurok tribe, the lady on the end mentioned that she had visited with them. They just got a $1.3 million grant for wetlands creation down there in the lower river, a complete farce of a project. What we have is we have a payout program going remarkably enough, and the Indian tribes are being used as a vehicle for this kind of a process. I don't really care at all about your rate, rate payers. I had enough Pacific Corps inheritance from my father and others that I'm independently wealthy. I run a 400 acre purebred Red Angus business. I delivered a bowl on my way down today, down here at Corning, which is about an hour and a half south of here. And I'm doing just fine, but my neighbors in there, it is a disaster. This state of California would rather issue marijuana, medical marijuana permits to keep everybody happy. Or establish more casinos to create gambling 
aberrations in people and wasting what little money they have with the hopes that they can win. It is an absolute disaster what's going on. And you add on top of the, of, of the fees you got, you, you people have been approving for, for, for Pacific Corps, on top of the fire tax, when we have fire truck drivers in Fort Jones getting gross salaries of over $100,000 a year, in addition to benefits and can retire at full salary at age 50, that's the kind of unionism that has taken place in the state of California. And I was born here in 1945. It's a sick day. You cleaning up this no fees on dam removal would go a long way to up the spirits of some very depressed people. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Dean Harris. Thank you for being here. I would appreciate you being up and weeding. It's about an hour and ten minutes up that way. North. Uh, well, some of the stuff has already been said, so I'm not going to go about the whole thing again. But uh, I would just want want to know: Does the CPUC support the individual ratepayers? From my understanding, the, the law says that they do. But the charges of fee for a dam that we don't know is going to come out seems to be illegal. Can you answer that for me? No answer. Uh, do you know uh, removing the dams is part of Agenda 21? <laughs> Have you ever looked at or taken the time to look at the 1992 diversity map? Do you already know that they care? Do you already know that they or have the idea or know that they can remove dams without us knowing it? I've sent information to Jerry Brown about Agenda 21. About all this dam removal is part of Agenda 21. It's basically to get out, get us out of rural areas, and that's what it's for. A lot of people have the median. The income just in Dunsmuir is $1,600 a month. Any rate increases sort of affects senior citizens a whole lot. I have to be a senior citizen. I have to be a Vietnam veteran. And the reason I like to fight this stuff is because my friends died there. And I would like to find out whether Jerry Brown or any politicians or any organizations are going to start backing up the people of the United States, which, which we pay our taxes for to support us. Uh, thank you very much. Okay, well, thank you, Mr. Harris. Okay, that's uh, the end of the, uh, the number of people that I have that have signed up. Is there anyone else that would like to uh, come forward and speak to us while we're, while we're here? If so, please feel free to come and use the microphone. Is there anyone else? Well, but we're going to conclude yeah. the meeting then. Yes, sir. Well, don't try to speak from there. Forward to the microphone. Well, we can't hear you. Well, I want you to hear you. No, I thought you did. <laughs> Please identify yourself and then speak your piece. I'm Steve Fisher. I live on the Klamath River. And uh, what I want to know is what gives anybody the right to make us pay for something we don't want to happen? I mean, it doesn't make sense. You remove the dams, you kill all the fish, and you can walk across the river in your tennis shoes and not get your socks wet. I lived that way back in, in the early 50s when I was first born. I know that river is called stinky. That's the definition of climate. You let it take the dam out and you'll have a real stinky river. And you'll let the government win on removing us from our own land. That's what they want to do. They want to move us out. Pretty soon we're all living in condos eating pills. Thank you. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Mr. 
Fisher, and that concludes today's uh, meeting here, public participation. The commission will be meeting tomorrow morning at 9.30, uh, right here in Reading. I will invite all of you to come and attend that meeting and to be a good business meeting. Thank you all very much for coming here today. Thank you.